was uh, Dr. Yusuf uh, revealing some shocking statistics concerning the physical and mental well-being of women and children in Baluchistan with no help in sight. Now I'll talk about uh, the rise of religious extremism in Baluchistan. This presentation will establish that the state of Pakistan is making concerted efforts to promote religious extremism in Baluchistan in order to counter the Baluch nationalism and the struggle for right to self-determination. However, this policy adopted by the state will not only destroy the foundations of a secular and democratic Baluch society, but it would also have some far-reaching consequences on regional and international peace and security. Before I take you through the slides, I would also like to talk briefly about why should you be concerned about a phenomenon, as in this case, the rise of religious extremism taking place about four and a half thousand miles away from the venue of this conference. Well, here is why. Our world today, as we all know, is divided into different political units we call as countries or states. The sense of loyalty to that state differs from one individual to another. The membership of this state is absolute in a sense in which the religious or ideological affiliation is not. When we talk about these religious extremist groups, their sphere of influence and loyalties transcend beyond the territorial boundaries of a particular state. Let's take the example of England where I live. There are religious extremists living in the north of England in areas such as Birmingham, Bradford and Luton that proudly and openly share their loyalties to the other extremist groups based in Pakistan or elsewhere in the world rather than to the Queen or to the law of the country. And they have, in recent times, been involved in carrying out various terrorist attacks claiming the, uh, many precious lives. This entire presentation should be seen in the same context. Baluchistan may not have been in the limelight as a victim or a breeding <coughs> ground of religious extremism, understandably, because of it having been eclipsed by the war on terror in neighboring Afghanistan and in the northern parts of Pakistan. But certainly, it hasn't been immune of this menace. Let's have a look at the Baluch and the role of religion in their society. The Baluch society is governed by a definite set of conventions and codes of cultural ethics, guiding its member in their cultural, social, and political affairs. And religion has never been a part of Baluch's identity. And they have never politicized religion. Having said that, they have never fought wars for the promotion or protection of religion. Although many of the Baluch consider themselves as Muslims, but their attitude towards religion is quite tolerant as compared to their neighbors. And it might be interesting for you to know that during the Hindu-Muslim riots in the 1947, no member of religious minority was harmed in Baluchistan. In fact, the Hindus fleeing from the areas that now constitute parts of Pakistan were provided refuge and protection in Baluchistan in a dignified and respectful manner. And most importantly, Baluchistan actually refused to become part of Pakistan mainly on the grounds of religion. It, it preferred to remain a separate political entity to ensure its identity, culture, language, and way of life remain intact. And these have remained to be the core basis of Baluch conflict with Pakistan today. And because Pakistan was made in the name of religion, it became imperative for its rulers to use religion as a coercive force to keep the culturally, linguistically, and historically distant people together under the banner of Islam. Diversity wasn't taken as an accommodative factor. And the Baluch nationalism was hated to an extent that it was considered as a threat to the very foundations on which the religious state was based. And it was also thought important to dilute the Baluch culture and way of life because Baluch being a proud people draw all their inspiration, their love for their fatherland and resilience from their cultural pool. So that was to make sure 
to silence the Belarusian national question once and forever. And the idea of using religion did not come to the state out of the blue. Instead, it is the legacy of the colonial era. The British first conceived the doctrine of Islamic nationhood in the 19th century to mobilize the Muslim population of Central Asia against the fast encroaching Russia to safeguard its Indian colonies. Prominent religious figures were hired and trained to disseminate the idea of pan-Islamism or Islamic nationhood that not only contributed in the partition of India, but also in the birth of Pakistan. And later in the 1970s, late 1970s, the then ruler of uh, Pakistan, General Ziaul Haq, initiated some Islamization policies to convert the entire country into an orthodox Sunni Muslim state. And Balochistan became a core area of his policies. The state identified three major fronts to uh, implement its Islamization policies. The first was to penetrate these jihadist groups in Balochistan and using these same jihadist groups to counter uh, the Baloch nationalism as well as to disrupt the social harmony by targeting the religious minorities who were living peacefully in Balochistan. And third, they needed a permanent source to continue these policies uh, for a long time. So the permanent source was identified as the expansion of madrasas. These madrasas are actually the religious schools and have, are widely recognized as main source of recruits for the Taliban and the other jihadist groups. So, seeing this man for the second time in the presentation, he is an important man in this wishes scheme. His name is Hafiz Sayyid, and he is the head of a UN-designated terrorist group called Lashkar Taiba. And he has said this at least twice in public, that his is the only organization that can pacify Balochistan. And his statements did not go unheard. In fact, in a very dramatic move, way was made for him to enter Balochistan. What happened in 2013, the Awaran district of Balochistan, that was also regarded as the hotbed of Baloch insurgency at that time, was hit by a major earthquake. And his organization, despite being enlisted as an international terrorist group by the UN and the US, Falai Insaniyat Foundation, was given an exceptional favor to provide relief work in Abaran. And neutral organizations such as Doctors Without Borders was refused entry despite its willingness to provide relief. And within a short period of time, the first ever military cantonment in Abaran was built. And then secondly, the same, uh, okay, out of the blue, Lashkar Khorasan, calling itself an affiliate of the ISIS, surfaced in Awara and killing six Zikri Baloch. Zikri are a renegade of uh, Orthodox Islam among the Baloch people. And after that, the same group was also found involved in a fight against the Baloch insurgents in Balnagwar area of Balochistan. According to Zara Yusuf, the former chairperson of Human Rights Commission of Pakistan, she said that the state is deliberately making way for these jihadist groups specifically to target the Baloch insurgents. So that, and also to make sure the Baloch do not mobilize the population on nationalistic grounds. And in a very recent interview uh, to Asia mm -hmm. Times, the retired Lieutenant General of Pakistan, Talat Masood, when he was asked about the reason behind the support to these jihadist groups, and he, while referring to the Baloch incident, goes, you want to fritter away, fritter away the strength of these groups. And instead of them targeting the state, you would want them to hit each other. And because given to the long terrain and difficult terrain of Balochistan, army cannot be deployed everywhere. So these bad guys will do the army's job. Pakistan is home to 146 UN-designated terrorist individuals and entities. 
This here, you see, is the map of Balochistan under the Pakistani control. The areas that you see highlighted in red shows the areas where the Pashtuns are in majority in terms of population, and that area is widely known as being the hotbed of Afghan Talibans. Whereas the remaining areas in blue highlight the areas where the Baloch live, uh, are in uh, majority in terms of population, and these are the groups that are active in Baloch areas. The first is Lashkar Taiba, Hafiz Said's group, and another splinter group of Lashkar Taiba, Lashkar Jangwi, and its affiliate Lashkar Jangwi Alami that associates itself with the ISIS. Then comes the Lashkar Khorasan, another splinter group of the ISIS, Al Furqan, calling itself an affiliate of the ISIS and the ISIS itself. Okay, then using the same groups to target the religious minorities in Pakistan. Pakistan, in general, has a terrible human rights record when it comes to its treatment of its religious minorities. According to Pakistan Bureau of Statistics, the number of religious minorities that constituted 23% of the total population in 1947 has reduced down to 3.6%. And mainly because of forceful conversion of uh, Hindus and Christians into Islam and the forceful uh, displacement compelling these religious minorities to flee to neighboring India while leaving their properties and businesses behind. And third, an institutionalized violation against these religious groups without any legal protection. I hope you can read these lines in highlighted in red. I'll read it out to you. It says, of course, Islam is the best religion in the eyes of God. Well, fine. But this is an inscription written in the main hall of the Federal Ministry of Religious and Minorities Affairs. Okay. And then, you see, let's talk about 2004. That's when the recent phase of Baloch insurgency started in Balochistan. And that's exactly when these jihadist groups began operating in Balochistan. Initially, they targeted the Hindu minorities, murdering them, extorting uh, acts of extortion and kidnapping them for ransom. And moving to figures, just between 2009-2015, 1,609 Shia Hazaras were murdered in lashkar jangwi carried out attacks. 15 Christians died in three major attacks carried out by the ISIS. Where? In Quetta city that is heavily patrolled by the paramilitary forces of Pakistan. And then, the religious state of Pakistan has its own unique ways of rewarding his jihadis. The Election Commission of Pakistan cleared 150 candidates of al Sunnat wa Jamaat, that is an affiliate of Lashkar Janwi, to run for the National Assembly elections held in July 2018. Third, and the most dangerous front opened up by the security forces in Balochistan. These graph show the data that has been, have been outsourced from two major sources. The one, the Madrasa Condorum, an extensive research done on the number of madrasas in Balochistan by Omar Khalil. And second, by Alif Elan, a non-profit uh, organization working on education in Pakistan since 2013. Now, according to these data, uh, we retrieved the data compiled during 2015 and 16. Bearing in mind that according to the uh, Ministry of Religious Affairs in Pakistan, the total number of registered madrasas in Pakistan in 1998 were just 8,000. And in 2015, the numbers of madrasas mainly only in Balochistan account to 12,000, uh, sorry, 13,000 whereas the total number of schools was just 12,950. And here, in this graph, you see the total number of uh, madrasas in each federated unit of Pakistan. And Balochistan is just behind Punjab in terms of the highest number of madrasas in the entire country. Here, 
It's a graph uh, taken from Malif Elan. It shows the total number of schools in Baluchistan in 2018, number to 13,000. Whereas here in this graph you see that there is one school for every 42 children in Baluchistan as compared to one madrasa for every 36 children in Baluchistan. On one hand, the state has been mushrooming these uh, jihadist groups and expanding madrasas. On the second hand, on the other hand, they have been using these jihadist groups to target schools in Baluchistan. In 2013, a bus carrying the students of uh, Baluchistan University of Information Technology and Management Sciences were targeted by Lashkar Jangwi. And in 2014, the only woman university in Baluchistan, Sardar Bahadur Khan University, was targeted by Lashkar Jangwi, uh, whereas uh, where uh, many innocent uh, girls died. And in 2015, Al Furqan, an affiliate of the ISIS, threatened the schools in Panjgur district of Balochistan, where I come from. They threatened the schools to stop providing girls education. Whereas the brave girls and women, they took to the streets and challenged these jihadist groups. And a new strategy adopted by the security forces of Pakistan is the militarization of educational, <coughs> excuse me, of educational institutions in Balochistan. According to the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan, over 700 military personnel are just stationed in the University of Baluchistan, the oldest and largest university in Baluchistan. And there are surveillance cameras installed all over the premises that have been used to record students in compromising situations. According to an investigation carried out by the Federal Investigation uh, Investigating Agency of Pakistan, about 500 such films were unearthed. And these were being used to extort money from the students and in many cases to sexually harass the female students. And I'm sure you wouldn't appreciate your family or friends studying in such an education institution. Well, uh, this is a quick timeline showing our perspective of war on terror. In 2011, the West was to curb the weeds of terrorism. And just five years down the line, remember the numbers of madrasas, how they exceeded schools? Okay, the budget allocated to the Ministry of Education in Balochistan in 2006 was 200 million rupees, 200 million rupees, as compared to 1.2 billion rupees allocated to the uh, Ministry of Religious Affairs. And moving on to 2014, Balochistan records the highest number of ratio of enrollment to madrasas in the entire country. And in 2016, 16, the madrasas literally outnumber schools in Baluchistan. And coming down to 2019, thousands of schools remain shut in entire Baluchistan, and Baluchistan records the lowest enrollment ratio to schools. What has the state achieved so far with the implementation of its uh, Islamization policies? The first, is we see an, uh, an exponential rise in the Tablighi phenomena. They call themselves a preacher of Islam, and uh, they say they do it in a peaceful manner. And the question rises that they keep organizing events in the entire country and also uh, go abroad to preach religion. But where is the money coming from? They have failed to show any declared sources of income. Secondly, the convention and defined role of a religious cleric in the Baloch society has transformed into a very authoritative social position of settling disputes and guiding its members in their political affairs. I'll skip the last paragraph and will end my presentation with these written words of Knox Thames, who is a special advisor for religious minorities at the US State Department. He said, and I quote, Yet not only human rights concerns, 
but real politic calculations also advise a stronger engagement by the international community. <coughs> Groups targeting Pakistani civil society and religious minorities have an agenda defying international standards and the current global order. Simply put, if they win at home, they will look abroad. One need only remember Mumbai in 2008 to agree on the seriousness of this threat. Thank you very much for this.